All right, very exciting. Right. Awesome. Welcome everybody. This is Burrows and Burbs episode 60. Can you believe that? It's amazing. Today is an incredible show and I'm extremely, extremely excited to have the two guests that we have. But first of all, I want to introduce my colleague, John Engel, who is a real estate broker for Douglas Elliman in Connecticut. And as you know, I work with Brown Harris Stevens here in Manhattan. So today we are covering commercial real estate. And we have two amazing guests who I'm so excited to have on the program. One, the first, Amir Karanji, who I had to track down at Sunset Beach in Shelter Island. We've been chasing him for a year to get him on the program, but we finally found him. Amir is the founder and the publisher of the real estate media company, The Real Deal. I mean, how could we even survive without The Real Deal? Um, he launched The Real Deal in 2003. My gosh, it's been almost 20 years. I remember when it was just a wee little, small little, little pamphlet almost. Uh, and now it is a must read for all of us. Prior to its launch, uh, he had several positions at Yahoo. He attended Boston University and Emerson College for degrees in journalism and foreign policy. He has also been included in the Observer's Most Influential People in Real Estate, as well as Inman's Most Influential me in Media. Though he lives in Manhattan, he secretly loves Brooklyn, from what I hear. <laughs> Amir, welcome. And Thank I also you, Robert. have Aaron, Feldman, who I've known for years and years and years, and whose opinion I respect incredibly. Um, he is the co-founder and principal of Benchmark Real Estate Group. He started his career in real estate about 20 years ago when he was working at the front desk of the Ritz-Carlton Hotel. <laughs> Since then, he has spent a tremendous amount of time in property management, asset management, construction, acquisitions, capital development, anything that you can even think of that relates to investing and managing real estate. But most recently, over the past 13 years, he's been building Benchmark Real Estate Group through a series of closed end private equity funds. Gentlemen, on behalf of John and I, thank you so much for your time and thank you for being here. We're extremely excited. So with that in mind, I just wanted to ask you guys with everything that's going on, are we optimistic? Are we pessimistic? I know that our market's very, very segmented, but I'd love to hear your general thoughts. Either of you want to start off. Aaron uh, probably has a better sense of it than uh, I would. Buckle your seatbelt, I, I think is probably <laughs> appropriate. Yeah, look, I, I, um, I'd say the volatility, um, you know, is un, 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 unreal um, every day, you know, as it relates to the macro environment and you know, that for us is, is capital markets, you know, how much does it cost to, to borrow? And, you know, that obviously has a lot to do with how we look at real estate and its value. And um, I'll back up and, and kind of, you know, make an observation or share an observation, you know, with regards to human behavior, because I think that it's interesting um, how we tend to overshoot in our way of thinking, you know, whether in good times or bad. So in good times, we tend to be euphoric and in bad times, we tend to be overly pessimistic. It, it, it's our nature. I guess it's how we're wired. So while the economy is teetering um, and likely to get a lot worse, uh, the truth is that nobody really knows what will happen next. Um, and prudence demands you know, that we prepare ourselves for all possible outcomes, including some positive ones. So at Benchmark, you know, I would say that we are um, very much observing. You know, we are not in a hurry to deploy capital. Um, we are pleased uh, you know, with where the portfolio rests you know, at this point. In the recovery, and we can talk kind of more about, you know, what that means uh, specifically, you know, if we want to get into that. Um, but generally, I'd like to say, you know, we're not reckless as it relates to to making investments, but taking risks is really the only way to consistently achieve above average returns. So, you know, we're always looking for ways to unlock potential. Um, you know, we're always talking to the relationships we have in the industry, which go back to you know 2004. You know, when I started working for a company called SG2 Properties, which is a very, very similar kind of you know, investment and management platform to our own. Um, and then you start to calculate risk. And I think right now, um, given all the uncertainty, it's, it's just very, very difficult. And for that reason, um, I would say we're, we're kind of cautious, nervous, but also optimistic, because I think you have to be when you're an investor. 
Yeah, I mean, for my thinking of it, I mean, are, are we talking about commercial real estate? Because I really do believe that, you know, there's a difference in sort of asset class you're talking about. But in general, if, you know, most of this audience, if uh, the real estate brokers, which I think they are, um, you know, my, you know, we've gone through this for a long time. We've been here for 20 years. I was in New York during September 11th, which was one of the worst uh, times uh, the city had to go through. You know, for brokers, I believe there's always an opportunity. You know, if uh, whether people are selling or buying or trying to hold off, there's always an opportunity. And, you know, in a good market, it's easier. Obviously, it's easier to uh, make money, but there's always only about 10 to 20 percent of the market that's really making deals happen. Now, in a good market for that 10 to 20 percent, they make those deals. It makes it a little bit easier for them. But in a good or a bad market, at the end of the day, there is 10, 20 percent of the, you know, of the industry that's making money on the investment side and on uh, on the brokerage side. So I feel like there's always an opportunity for our for this business, for the brokerage business, there's always an opportunity to create something for yourself. And it depends how you go about it. I mean, if as a broker, you go in there and like you really go in with the headlines and say, well, this is a terrible time. Mortgage rates are so high and there's a good the inventory is growing and so and so. Yes, I mean, if you go in there with that sort of a thinking, then yes, you're going to hit those walls uh, that you're going to hit. But uh, there's always an opportunity. There's always good times. There's, there are people who are distressed into selling. There are people who have to move cash. Uh, the U.S. dollar is at a, in a great place where, you know, we they have, people have money to go out there and, you know, get properties if they want to in other countries. We're going to get hurt with, you know, the foreigners trying to come in here and buy stuff. But uh, I feel like there's always a great opportunity to uh, sort of be active in the market. And that goes for investors, too. But look, in the last seven or eight years, uh, you know, prior to COVID, the, and actually part of COVID as well, um, it was easier to make money. I mean, people, if you look at the headlines, there's always the headlines since 2017, when the Chinese money was pulled out, out of commercial real estate, for the most part. And people were like, oh, well, we're going to hit a slowdown. We're going to hit a slowdown. But then deals continue to happen. The big guys were doing deals. People are still building the uh, uh, commercial office space. There is, there is major projects going on or being uh, presented in Chicago, in Austin, like in New York. I mean, in New York, you're seeing significant uh, deals happening, 200, 300,000 square foot leases happening. Um, but there is going to be a segment of the market that's really going to suffer in commercial real estate, obviously. You have in New York alone, you have 500 million square feet of commercial office space. And um, there is going to be a segment of that market that's really going to suffer, especially the ones that can't reposition themselves for another use. Because the people who can get the larger spaces, they do choose to go into newer buildings. And, you know, when Hudson Yards was going up in 2017, 18, I was saying to myself, like, how are they planning to fill all of that commercial space? And, you know, it turns out that there is great demand for new office space. So I feel like there is a still opportunity. There's always that 80-20 split where, you know, 20% of the market is going to make money no matter what happens. And then there's going to be that uh, 80%. And in a good or a bad market, they're not really going to be active. You know, it's ironic because it seems that COVID actually presented an opportunity for some of those larger buildings and some of those newer buildings. For, because everybody was just flying out of the other spaces and they're, they're going to the quality spaces. So let me just, you know, prices, uh, CB Richard Ellis put out a report. They said the prices were down approximately 4% 4, 4 from 2019, but that they've, re, they've partially improved about 3% in the last year. But with that said, the net effective rent is down 24%. I mean, that's a lot of free rent being given away. I mean, what are the sort of incentives? What else is included in that to bring that, that number down so far? I really feel like on the commercial side, the other shoe hasn't fallen yet. Like we're still waiting for the other shoe to fall. But, uh, you know, the people who can't do deals, they're doing them. You see the major guys like Vornado, like SL Green, trying to sell off their older assets, maybe not at the best price and trying to reinvest in newer assets. But, um, you know, again, just in New York City, 500 million square feet of office space is, uh, even if everybody comes back to the office and you have 20% vacancy, that's 100 million square feet. Like, um, you know, and the building is a living organism. If you have 100 million square feet of space that's just sort of sitting there and not being used, it has to be maintained. It's not gonna be maintained, I mean, not all of it. So it, it really, like we have to figure out another use for that space 
uh, because that other shoe hasn't fallen yet. And yeah, a lot I, of that space is obsolete. Sorry, Aaron, go ahead. Yeah, I, I was going to add the same, which is, you know, you're seeing almost two different markets, um, you know, adjust to, you know, this kind of whatever, you know, post COVID, you know, we want to call hybrid work or, you know, this, this adjustment in, you know, consumption patterns around, you know, office space, the good buildings, as Amir kind of described, are renting, you know, well at, at rents that exceed, you know, pre-COVID levels considerably. Um, those are buildings that provide an experience. It's not just the utility of that space anymore, right? There's a social component to it. Uh, there's a lifestyle component to it. Um, the same can be said for retail and for residential, right? You're seeing unique space that, you know, appeals to the consumer, the tenant, you know, differently, um, you know, than it has had to in the past, right? With retail, it's not just about going to the store that sells milk. It's about going to the store that makes you feel good, right? Where you get to, you know, generate more value than, than simply the utility of buying something. So I, I think those are, are going to continue to do well. And then, you know, look, the, the kind of obsolescence you described, Roberto, is everything else. And I think, you know, the, the kind of functionality, you know, of that space, this is a, you know, fundamental issue, right, as it relates to, you know, real assets. It's the evolution of function. Gener generally in New York, the infrastructure is very old, right? So whether it was COVID, which accelerated, you know, the conversation around the utilization of office buildings, um, you know, that are antiquated and incapable of tracking demand in a, on a go forward basis, um, the real estate isn't, you know, necessarily obsolete. I think the contrary, there's a lot of value embedded in the land and, and, they, and, and possibly in the buildings, but it requires change in policy and laws that govern use. And, you know, it's a longer conversation about that, but, but yeah, I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty bleak, you know, for, 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 you know, operators of commercial office uh, that are in tertiary locations or, you know, simply kind of outdated and, and obsolete, particularly with near-term loan maturities and things like Aaron, that. It's funny you bring up the experience side, like, like there are record leases happening in terms of price per square foot and uh, the one Vanderbilt and 425 Park and some of these places. Sure. You know, I was talking to my team about this uh, earlier in the week and I was like, for, you know, for a major tenant to move from the east side to the west side or up to town to downtown, you're talking about a 75, $90 million move. It's not like, you know, Moshe's movie co coming and moving your office. It's a major, major logistical uh, issue. And, you know, it doesn't matter if they're moving across the country or they're moving across town. It's, you're talking about tens of millions of dollars just to make that move for additional uh, for additional rent. So some of these guys are leaving 6th Avenue and 3rd Avenue, going to the west side, spending a tremendous amount of money on the move, spending a lot of sort of marketing and branding changes and whatever they have to uh, do. And, you know, my uh, thinking is like, what, what are these buildings really offering? I mean, you mentioned they're going in there for the experience. How great can that experience be? And what are the amenities that the older buildings couldn't just add? You know, there was uh, the Fishers that spent $150 million dollars on updating one of their Park Avenue buildings, prime Park Avenue building. And what, what is it that that building doesn't have with a $150 million upgrade that a newer building has? That, that part I haven't understood. I, I'm having my team work on an article on that, but I still don't understand the motivation for spending a fortune to move across town into a new office space because they're like, well, they have better amenities. Well, Jesus Christ, everybody knows nobody uses the amenities. So to spend that kind of money to just for amenities or because of the experience, I really would like to understand that better other than just, you know. Sort yeah, of it's, a, it's a good, it's a really good point and good observation. I, I, I read a book and I, I'm forgetting the author's name. I, I want to say it's Pauline Brown, but it, I could be wrong during COVID. And, um, and I, I think the title was aesthetics of design, right? So, so her belief and she'd spent her career in kind of corporate marketing and, and, you know, for major Fortune 500 companies like L'Oreal and others, um, you know, in, in her kind of study was, was around the way that design makes you feel. And she brought up a number of real life examples, right? Things like, you know, in, in the evolution of that design. So take, you know, airports and hospitals, which were, you know, always uninspired as it relates to design. It was never a place where you were outsourcing that work to very capable, thoughtful people. It was just the utility again of that 
application, you're going to pick a tile. Why not pick a nice one? And I think that's where design has gone. Of course, when you're talking about, you know, Hudson Yards and these developers, you know, really thinking about every single design decision from start to finish. And, and, and of course, the outgrowth of that is a product that just makes you feel better. And that's the same thing with LaGuardia. I mean, you go into one of those new terminals, it's kind of a place you don't mind spending a little bit of time, you know, between flights or during a layover or something like that. So I think design, um, you know, as simplistic as it might sound, and as kind of hard as it is to put your finger on it, when you feel good, you feel good. And that's a large part of it. So I want to get to the question of where are we in the cycle? Uh, Roberto asked a question at the top of the hour. Are you optimistic? I want to ask it differently because in the write-up, Roberto said, where are we in the recovery? And I was struck by that because, Aaron, when I read about your investments in the real deal, you were a seller from 2015 to 2017. You were a seller. And then you were raising money in 2020, 2021 in order to go reacquire. And so that, that speaks to an optimism. And, um, and yet, uh, here we are. Are we recovering from the pandemic or are we afraid of a recession? So where are we in the cycle? Are you a buyer or are you a seller? Yeah, so I, I like to think that we're, you know, we're, we're kind of always both. You know, I think there's different reasons strategically, you know, to be buying or selling. And, and Amir pointed out some of those before. But, yeah, look, I'm generally very nervous, um, you know, with where, you know, we are. Um, and keep in mind that the majority of my investments are concentrated in New York City. So I don't have the, the broadness of strategy to necessarily speak to local fundamentals in other markets. Um, although I would say my concern is a macro one. And I, I, I think we've come a long way, um, you know, from the summer of 2020, when I had very specific concerns as it relates to demand for apartments in New York City. You know, when we were the global epicenter of a pandemic, my my day to day looked a whole lot different. We were trying to, you know, find stability and we've recovered, you know, greatly from that point. This concern today is driven by all of the macro risk that is in the system. So, yeah, I, 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 I like to say, as I kind of tried to before, that you know, we will take risks that we understand. Um, you know, we start every analysis with the downside. Where uh, is I... that risk coming from? Is it coming from interest rates, Fed policy? Because there's still a lot of liquidity out there. People can still get mortgages, even though they're a little higher than they'd like. Where is the risk? Is it a global war? Is it supply chain risk? It's, all, it's, risk? it's, it's all of that. I mean, I think primarily within real estate, um, you know, when interest rates, they've never accelerated this quickly, um, this dramatically over, over, you know, a short period of time, you've seen, you know, borrowing rates go from 3% to six and a half or 7%. I mean, the 10 years at nearly 4% and you're looking for a very conservative multifamily invest. And I'm talking market rate apartments, um, well located where you're able to get maybe 50%, maybe 55% loan to value at a very conservative debt yield. And this may be a little bit too technical, so I apologize. But my point here is- We love that, technical. We love yeah, technical. Yeah, my, my, my point is simply that that profile will get you 200 basis points over the 10-year, which is around 6%. So it's, it's going to be much more difficult to make a deal work without pricing adjustments. And those pricing adjustments, seller's expectations, like that gap between what we wanna pay, um, which are tomorrow's pricing, you know, we have to say, versus what sellers want, which is yesterday's pricing. Like we haven't bridged that gap yet, that takes time. So the opportunity exists when that gap narrows, right? We start to see opportunities or as Amir kind of, you know, pointed out, like there will be distress. There are, you know, a tremendous amount of loan maturing you know, loans maturing over the next couple of years, um, you know, whether it's negotiating with banks to buy paper or it's, you know, buying, you know, assets, I, well, time will, you know, tell. But yeah, I, I think the risk is, you know, the Fed is out there trying to destroy the economy, um, trying to impair the consumer, make sure that demand for everything slows down. And that's why you've seen housing slow down. You've seen oil go from, I don't know, 125 to 75, natural gas less expensive. Um, 
you know, lumber is back to, you know, pre-COVID levels. So it's working, right? They're, they're achieving their intended task. Um, I don't know when that ends. I, I'm not that smart enough, but, but we're, we're, we're here paying attention. And, um, and to your point, we do have the liquidity to kind of pursue an opportunity, you know, if and when, let's just say if, um, you know, they exist. But you're careful. Program. Sounds like you're being, you're careful. You're well, I manage other people's buyer. money in addition to my own, right? So there's an enormous responsibility that goes along with that. Um, so I can be a little bit more carefree or risk averse as it relates to myself. But, you know, that, that's a whole lot different, you know, at, at this point in, in, in our business when we manage, you know, a lot of, a lot of other people's assets. Let, let, let me ask you, we, we'd spoken about a little bit about the macro issues coming into Manhattan, policy issues, challenges, what are the things that you see are the most, both of you guys, as the biggest obstacles uh, for some improvement right now? I think in terms of policy, the first thing the government needs to realize is that they have to act fast in terms of zoning changes that they need to do and allowing some of these buildings to be repurposed if they need to be or if they're asking to be and uh, not have to go through the normal rigmarole that it takes to make some of these changes. And uh, it's, that might sound a little reckless, but we can't wait for, again, if, if it's only 20%, we can't wait for us to be at 20% vacancy. And obviously right now it's a lot more, but we, again, the other shoe hasn't fallen. But when the other shoe has fallen and we realize there's 100 million square feet of office space that's sitting empty and there's no taxes being collected on it for the city. Look, real estate is the number one source of taxes for the city, for the top 22 cities in America. Real estate is the number one source of taxes. So when you got, again, if you only have hundred million square feet, which would be fine, uh, then you got that much space, not paying taxes, not being used. We don't want to wait around for that to happen. We just have to be very proactive about it. And there's a lot of landlords and a lot of people who are holding those buildings who totally agree with them. And they're like, yes, I, mean, I want to make these changes and I want the government to work with me and I want the entitlements and the permitting to be uh, not, not be a three to five year process for me to do this. We got to jump in front of this as fast as possible. One of the big issues we have is that, you know, our policymakers are not always as educated as they need to be on some of these topics. And, uh, you know, they sort of have a short-term view of how to look at things um, because they have to get reelected. But, um, yeah, but that's something that we, it's, we have to make the effort to educate them. You know, we had two major projects in the last six months or four months. I think one was in Queens and one was in Harlem. And billion-dollar projects that got shut down. I mean, you're talking about housing. We keep saying there's a shortage of housing. And... Uh, you know, they want it 50% affordable. It's just not sustainable. You can't build something and make it 50% affordable. The fact that they're willing to do it at the levels that they're trying to do it, I, you know, it's, we got, we want to encourage the building. We want to encourage housing. You know, rents have gone through the roof and then you got policymakers who are blocking uh, developments that are not only adding a major amount of money to the city's taxes, but creating housing for the city as well. I have to I have to add to that that I'd never seen it before, but a New York developer, a buyer of buildings, because I Googled him and I found articles in the real deal that this guy buys buildings in Brooklyn and Manhattan all over the place for the last 20 years. And I said, why are you calling me? And he said, it's too hard to operate in New York right now. I want to look at throughout Fairfield County find me opportunities. I was like, what are you talking about? He said, it takes years to get approvals and it's just way too risky an environment. And, and, and the policy is so adverse in New York right now that he says, you know, I've got to look outside the city. So there's not I'm a, there's starting not a, to see evidence of it. There's not a major investor in New York City that has is not investing out in Texas and in South Carolina, in North Carolina, and some of these states that are super you know, friendly to development. And, uh, you know, I, we ex expanded coverage into Texas this past year, and I went to uh, Dallas in July, which was a terrible time to go to Dallas. Mm -hmm. uh, but I went there and, uh, you know, I'm meeting with these major landlords and these developers, and they're like, they're all in unison. They're like, we, we can't buy anything that's on the market. 
because you got this uh, New Yorkers coming with stupid money and they're like, oh my God, 4% cap. We're so interested. We'll pay you whatever you need. And they can't compete in that market because these guys were used to building at 7%, 6% caps. And, uh, and they're, they're only buying stuff off market because there's so many New York investors in the Dallas and the Austin markets. That, the first uh, thing they ask that. for is, what do you have a, a, a beginning at 100,000 feet and greater? And I was like, I scratched my chin and I said, I don't have anything like that. You do know this is Connecticut, don't you? <laughs> you, could, you could tell me he could build it. Look, I, 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 I could just add a couple of things because um, we, we, we have diversified our portfolio as well. Um, you know, I think the days of underwriting double digit rental growth annually are, are you know, unfortunately behind us in a lot of these markets. I grew up in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, you know, it's an interesting story. I, you know, I continue to track it. It's a small city. Um, the growth has been driven by, you know, largely tourism. And, 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 and it's probably not the alpha city that it's getting credit for being, although it's a fun place to spend a weekend. Uh, but back to New York, because I, I have a lot of conviction in, um, regardless of the adversity, adversity the city is kind of dealing with and continues to deal with, um, you know, it still remains relatively intact, much as it was before COVID. Um, and so much of the personality and the energy is back. And, and I think that's kind of a chief characteristic that people seek, you know, or, or think of uh, when they think of New York. Um, so I, I really didn't have a doubt that New York would recover. Um, and I think that if you expand on that, mega cities are an unstoppable trend, I believe, right? I, I, in a, over a three or five year period, you know, if you're looking at investment, this is a different conversation. But I think the trend line over a longer period of time, regardless of this temporary disruption, is proximity breeds innovation. Um, youth prefer optionality, economies of scale for public goods like healthcare, education, transportation. These are important things. These are concentrated centers of commerce. It's productive. Um, and then you can get into like decreased carbon footprints and things like that that, that, are, that are kind of thoughtful as well. But I, I remain optimistic that brighter days are ahead for the big urban markets. Of course, you know, I'm biased and think New York City is the greatest one. But as Amir pointed out, I mean, it is a balance between policy which governs what you can do with a particular building or neighborhood and the cost to actually change the use and whether that generates return, right? So there's some kind of skewed interests between the public and private sector that we need to, you know, we need to address. And politically, yeah, it's super frustrating. I mean, we want elected officials to provide direction and have ideas, right? And that's, I mean, the solutions take time, but I think too often, you know, you hear about things that are just so vague and overly generalized, like, promote better living or revitalize the city, which of course nobody objects to, but I'm not sure what it means either. So I think good leadership would go a long way uh, in terms of solving some of these long-term problems. Um, and I could speak you know, just quickly to one specific example of some of the you know, frustration that exists around you know, the approval process that relates to Department of Buildings. Um, we have about 20 times the amount of retail square footage in New York City per capita as they do in London. And so by virtue of that, and of course, there have been shifts in consumer behavior around you know, the internet and, and kind of other things that associate with you know, why bricks and mortar slow down for a period of time. And fortunately, it's recovering again, but there still continues to be a lot of vacancy in the city. So we have dozens of assets in the East Village on the first floor. You know, when these buildings were initially built, they were 100% residential for the most part. And instead of retail vacancy, we brought in architects to redesign apartments. Um, good light and air, you know, legal egress, and put it in front of plan examiners and have just continued to get rejected. And, and we're not exactly sure why. And we live in a city today where affordability of housing is a primary issue and concern. Um, certainly retail, there doesn't need to be as much of it. And yet we can't even figure out how to convert a ground floor unit into a other use where there's a tremendous amount of demand. So again, before we start converting, you know, 500,000 square foot office towers, which is a whole different animal, it'd be helpful to take some baby steps. But, you know, I guess what's, these are tough conversations. What's, what's the resistance to that? I just think there's not, there's a lack of leadership, right? There's not a kind of, there's not really a formal I don't, again, I'm, I'm speculating. I, I, no, I, but what I is know. the resistance? What is the resistance to having retail turned into residential? It's what is the argument it, against it's it? A, it's a change of use. It's density. It's, it's things that, from my perspective, 
are very low on the value chain, right? As a city, like you're always thinking about, you know, like, 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 you know, what do we value, right? Like, like I mentioned Charleston where I grew up and, and, and I studied in New Orleans. So, you know, these are both cities that, that have a rich cultural heritage um, that tied directly back to the historical preservation of most of the buildings, you know, in these two cities, right? That's kind of what they're famous for. Now, that being said, it's important to preserve up until the point where there are other priorities. And so the way I would reframe it as it relates to New York City is sure, they may be concerned about density for whatever reason, you know, we're not gonna compromise safety, but you know, if you're telling me a legal bedroom's eight by eight, and I'm saying, look, there's been advancements in furniture. We have some things today that are modular, some things that lay out a bit better than they used to 30 years ago when the code was written. Um, we're, we're still gonna have legal light and air egress so you can get out in the event of an emergency. Um, but why is it that we're sticking to, you know, this, what seems to be this kind of arbitrary rule about the size of a bedroom? Um, you know, when we have more pressing needs, uh, which are affordability. So I think, again, it starts to, it goes back to like, where does that dialogue, you know, what's, where's, what's the forum for having these conversations? And, you know, how do we kind of decide on our value system as a city? And then you got to start ranking things as it relates to change because evolution. That can, that can be extrapolated out to a lot of the B and C buildings that are in like the West thirties, et cetera, that preservationists may be resistant to, you know, some of those buildings, maybe they're better uses to get rid of them and change the sure. use of them and build something new. Even, you know, but is the, is the compromise, look, we'll keep the facade, like all of these buildings, you know, you see there's a, it's just a, it's just an envelope that they keep just so that it looks a certain way, but inside it's a different structure. I mean, is that, a, is that a, even a slight compromise? Not for me. I mean, I, I think we got to make some real uh, dramatic changes. Um, you know, it's how, Aaron, who, what has to happen? How do you get the private and the public together? Like, for example, maybe after 9-11, where they really did come together and they really, the infrastructure of all downtown was completely redone. It took 10 years. It took an emergency. It took a, it took a tragedy. <laughs> but someone could say that with COVID and everything, we've kind of gone through a tragedy. And if we look at it in a different way that, you know, like, COVID is the war that our generation ever went through. You know, we were all, we were, we, our, our lives were, were put into such extreme places that we were, it didn't make any sense. It was like being in a war. Why can't we look at this in that, in that way to prepare us for the next 40, 50 years? I, yeah, I, it looks, part of this, it'll happen just inefficiently. You know, I think that there've been some things you know, thinking back over the last 20 years um, that have been handled well, right? I think Bloomberg did a good job creating public space and convenient space. And, you know, we have more, you know, parks than we used to. And, you know, generally New York is in pretty good standing internationally as it relates to, you know, kind of open air opportunities. Um, I mean, think about Tokyo, 5% of the entire city is allocated towards parks. Like that's crazy. London, I think at the other end is at 30%, which is why so many people love living there. Um, you know, so this is just one example. It's not to say the entire system is broken. You know, some things have been done well, but I don't, I, I don't unfortunately have the answer. I think that, as I said before, solutions will take time, but I, you know, we have to put our partisan views aside and, and just find the balance between what we've always valued as a city and, and what that means going forward. I, I, you know, it's change is important. I mean, I think, Look, my office was on 60th and Madison for, 50, for 10 years. Um, you know, retail, as I mentioned before, and we all have seen it get disrupted. And I think the department store is somewhat of a relic. Um, you know, Barney's was a cultural beacon, both for locals and for visitors. Um, Barney's is out of business, right? Like that space is vacant. And I, I, I know there's a, you know, a traveling, you know, Louis Vuitton, you know, museum of sorts that's, that's, that's coming in, but it's been vacant for, you know, a few years now and it wasn't COVID related. So look, change is inevitable. Um, 
We'll I see. sit on a planning and zoning board, and let me tell you the opposite point of view. We are, and two nights ago, this came up. We have a development in front of us, 80,000 feet of uh, residential apartments, and they've put 475 feet of retail on the ground floor. This is uh, 100 yards from our retail district. And so the point came up for many of the commissioners. They said, can't you add a little bit more retail on the ground floor? We don't want to give up. I know you can talk about macroeconomic trends, but we don't want to give up the feeling of a village where people are walking the streets, looking in the shop windows, talking to each other, the walkability. They live, we want them to live close to the retail. And we think retail is a great uh, asset and we're not willing to just uh, re rewrite the zoning laws and get no, rid no, of no. Our, our retail. Yeah, no, that, that's certainly the point I was, I was trying to make, and, and I, I may not have spoken clearly, wasn't to suggest that retail in and of itself is antiquated. Like, like retail and diversification of streetscape is incredibly important. I mean, that, that again is New York City, right? Like you need to be able to engage um, with your retailers um, in a, on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and, and like that accessibility is key. There's just too much of it. I mean, I, I'm not, by the way, you just walk down the street, you see it for yourself. I mean, rents are, are recalibrating, um, you know, due to a lack of demand and space is being absorbed, but not all of it. And so it was only to, su to suggest that, look, department stores aren't succeeding the way they used to, that's a fact. Um, we have too much retail in New York City, I think that's, that's a fact. But those retailers that are more thoughtful, and you're seeing a lot of the kind of, you know, the, the, the I would say more millennial brands that were kind of internet first brands that were direct to consumer have shifted their focus and strategy a bit to start taking retail space because it's cheaper than a acquiring customers online. So yeah, look, there's a big future and I've been investing aggressively um, into retail. If there's a sector that I've been active in, it's been high street retail. So we've bought over the last year, we've allocated about $75 million between Madison Avenue, the Hamptons, uh, Westchester County and Palm Beach, right? So we've been big believers in people going back and shopping in person. So yeah, I wasn't trying to suggest otherwise. You were saying that uh, New York City has 20 times more retail than London? That's correct. Per capita, wow. square footage. And I think wow. when you're in Mayfair, you kind of get that feel. Like people compare Mayfair to the Upper East Side, but it's much more residential. Mm -hmm. You know, there's shopping corridors. The same with like Paris, right? It's, it's along certain avenues. Um, it's not everywhere. It's not the base of every single building for the most part. <laughs> That's yeah. Uh, Amir, I want to hear about trends in the real estate industry generally. I think it's fascinating that you've expanded after 20 years in the business. You went to Miami and then you added L.A. and now you've added Texas. Um, uh, San Francisco, Chicago uh, as well. Yeah. Where, I mean, so for us, when does it end? I mean, we like to it be never does. A, we'd like to be in as many markets as possible. But, you know, COVID presented something that we never thought about before which was uh, that some of these locations can be uh, remote, not remote in terms of the reporters and editors, they can be on the ground, but uh, we don't need a physical office space. We will get a WeWork or a shared office or something, but we don't need to plant an office space the way we used to think about growth because now we can do a lot of the back end, you know, in New York, in our, we, you know, our headquarters are here in Hudson Yards and uh, we've added a lot more people. We've actually grown by, you know, 40% since uh, COVID started. So it's, um, you know, I feel like there's a transition in everything. I, you're, we're talking about these things in real estate, how real estate is being used differently and how it needs to repurpose, some the retail needs to repurpose, office space, what is it gonna be? How are people gonna use it? And you think real estate is bad. I mean, media is 10 times worse. I mean, if I started a media company in the 1980s, I wouldn't have to change my business model for 40 years. Uh, no, 1980s for, for 30 years. It would be the same business model for 30 years. In the last 10 years, I had to change my business model three times. And, you know, and luckily for us, we're an independent company and we get to move fast. But if you are not with the transition and the transformation that's happening literally in every industry, you're just going to suffer I was at this round table with the CEO of, uh, uh, the, of the New York Post and some other media companies. And it's interesting. It doesn't matter whether you have 
billions of dollars behind you or your uh, me, and uh, we're all going through the same things. Like you, you know, the guy who has unlimited resources is going through the same troubles as I'm going through with the different positions that we have to hire, the different systems that we all have to use, or you know, the change is happening so fast that it's immediate. Like something in the algorithm changes you know, here and your business is impacted tremendously on this side. So if you're able to move fast, great. And if you're not, you take a hit, you suffer as a result of it. But we're totally- but there's, enough business, there's enough to write about in the Dallas commercial real estate market. Yeah, so da- its own. yeah. So Dallas by 2026, Dallas is going to be the third largest city in America, right? It's the fastest growing city in America right now. And, uh, you know, it's sort of under the radar, but, you know, Dallas, Fort Worth, the airport, the landmass of that airport is the size of Manhattan. Just to give you an idea, there is a major, you know, hub there. It's coming and going. And you got people from California and all over the country moving there because they make it very favorable. It's very easy to build there in terms of real estate. If you want to get some, if you want to get entitlements on something, you go in there tomorrow and you'll get it done, you know, in uh, by the end of the month. If you want to start a business, you can go in there and get a permit for, you know, for any sort of a business permit or a lot of business permits. And they have them in 11 languages. They understand it's a very, it is, it's a very, di- people assume that, uh, you know, Texas is very white and all of this stuff, but Dallas is actually a progressive city. Their mayors are all Democrats. They have very progressive policies and um, it's a, it's a great market. That's why we wanted to go there. And the, lo- the number of transactions and the volume of, uh, you know, uh, business that's happening there, it's very interesting and exciting. So that's my favorite we- uh, Dallas data point, which, cause I agree with all that is, um, 100 schools, K through 12, not all of them straight through, but, you know, somewhere in that range have opened in Dallas over the last five years. I mean, that is outrageous if you track yeah. any of these demographics. I mean, it just says a lot of people are moving there um, and building, you know, communities um, that just didn't exist even 10 years ago. So, you know, Dallas, to Amir's point, in, in Fort Worth, the Metroplex is enormous, um, you know, between the two and, of course, north. And then south, you know, you'll, you'll start to see, I think, over time, Austin and Dallas kind of look a whole lot more like one enormous city than, than two that triangle, around. right? That triangle oh, of Houston. Totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah Houston as well. Yeah, I mean, Texas is, uh, that's a good point, for sure. You know, and you had headquarters moving there left and right. You know, the PGA, AT&T, uh, Goldman Sachs is about to open up the 500 million square foot campus in Dallas. So there is a major stuff happening. And I was, when I was there for that month in July, I do not recommend it. But when I was there for that time, I met this one broker who was like, I got in with somebody at Goldman Sachs. I've sold 11 homes to Goldman Sachs executives. And that's been his whole target. He's like targeting all these Goldman Sachs people who are slowly trickling in from other parts of the country to move to Dallas. And that's become his uh, whole business. So it was, for us, it was a no brainer. We look at a lot of different matrix since before we decide which market to go to. And we have like 103 different points we look at to see what hits. And sometimes a smaller city will come into play. Like we went to San Francisco. San Francisco is a small city. And uh, we decided to go there because we were already in LA. But, uh, you know, we, I, I get more traffic and more subscriptions from Dallas. And I've only been there for, you know, less than a year than any other outside of Miami, any other market. So after it's New York, you know, Florida that we get the most amount of views and uh, subscribers from. And then it's Texas. Like, you know, they're just hungry for information and data because um, you, they don't have the sort of coverage that you have here in New York and some of the other markets. So we're, so, so now crystal ball, where, where, where's the action moving? I mean, Dallas doesn't sound like a secret anymore. No, it's not. It's a, you know, it's a, I think a lot of yeah, people are going there. I, I like to sort of, uh, reaffirm our position in some of these markets and provide this sort of content that we provide in New York and Miami, because in the past we were like, we'll cover them lightly. Like we'll do like seven, eight stories a day versus New York that does 20 stories or Miami that does, you know, 14, 18 stories a day. And we cover those markets very good. So for us right now, the focus is to be able to, you know, add people to those markets and really build them up the way New York and uh, South Florida are. And I feel like LA is on its way there now, Chicago is on its way. And, uh, you know, next year or so, hopefully Texas. But I was talking to the, the mayor of Dallas yesterday uh, and he was, um, I was telling him, I was like, you know, our biggest challenge was that we were supposed to have 18 people in Texas. 
And I'm at nine people or eight people right now in Texas. There's no talent. Like it's really hard to find talent or want, have talent to be able to go there. And I hate to say that because that sounds very broad and you know probably not the right way to frame you it told but the mayor you're you're in a no talent town <laughs> no he know he admits it he admits that <laughs> look we don't have the draw that like i tell like if i want to move people down to miami if there's a lot of talent in chicago and i'm like i don't need you in chicago but i need more people in miami so you get like four people raising their hands ready to move to miami i can't it's not as easy to get people to move to you know to texas so that's a that's a challenge for us just like By the, the way, class Building versus the class B building. Right. Yeah, it's also yeah. a good segue back to you know New York, and and I'm beating a dead horse here, but I'm so biased um, that you know I can't help myself. But you know New York City is still the most creative playground in the world, I believe, for new ideas. Right, so plenty of challenges, but we have such a wonderful resource, you know, in the people, which is kind of why I remain optimistic that with the right policy, you know, we can leverage ideas, come up with the right solutions, and continue letting people you know, pursue dreams. There's another place in the country, I don't think, as someone who came to New York from another place, um, and I, I don't know that I speak for everyone, but I think there are a lot of others who, who kind of come here and inherently feel like, you know, there's a bright future. And if you want to accomplish something great, you know, New York City provides the opportunity to do it. Um, and so I think people are signing on, right, that are super ambitious and ready to participate in whatever, you know, elevate, you know evolution, um, you know, is going to occur. So one more. Yeah. Allowing people, especially, you know, people who are not in finance and, you know, in insurance or some of these other industries, allowing people to come here and especially for immigrants or uh, allowing them to come to the city and being able to start businesses. It's like, if I want to start a business in the city, it should be easy. It's not easy, but like, you know, it shouldn't be a six month, eight month ordeal. I can't afford not to have my business. I got to go do another job until I get those permits. If somebody wants to start a business, take retail space, uh, there shouldn't be this you know, arduous uh, process for them to be able to start that business. I mean, the idea of being pro-commerce, there's really a thing. It's not just like saying like, we're pro-commerce. There, there is you know, steps that you take to, to be a, a, you know asset to people who want to start businesses. Like, it, like I mentioned in Dallas, they have their permitting their, for, to uh, start a business you could pick up that application in 11 languages. That's a small thing to do. You could be from anywhere and not really speak English. Go to the Dallas uh, City Hall and be able to get that license for whatever business you want to start in 11 different languages. And I think that's a small thing, but that's huge. Allowing And pushing them and encouraging people. They have a retail service there where they're like, you want to start this kind of a business? And they tell you that like this kind of a business can highly succeed in this area, in that area. They actually push that kind of thinking on people like, you know, Joe Blow wants to come and start a, you know, sandwich shop and they'll tell him, they're like, you know, these areas need sandwich shops. You have the uh, uh, good likelihood of succeeding if you open up a sand sandwich shop in these neighborhoods. That's pro-commerce, like, if, uh, you know, allowing those kind of services for people who want to do business and add to the community. It's, you know, those are the sort of steps we can do to be pro-commerce. And I feel like in, you know, in New York, they just add regulations and layers and layers for people to be able to do something. I mean, you know, one thing happens and the whole industry has to rewrite everything and, uh, you know, to be able to uh, make up for that correction that th for this one incident that happened. And, you know, sometimes there are terrible things that happen, but this, you know, local law 11, I think it's just insane. I mean, I, I'm sure, you know, you have to deal with that more than anybody else, but, you know, it's so ridiculous for me that we have to put up the scaffolding all throughout the city. And it's, um, you know, it just adds another cost uh, to people who own buildings. I sort of jumped around there, but you get the idea. Yeah, no, for sure. The scaffolding is, is the worst. I mean, I think the, <clears throat> the, uh, the passiveness with which the city manages those permits is like, you know, there's a dozen or so scaffoldings that have been up since, I don't know, I want to say like 15 or 20 years. There's a story recently somewhere I read, but uh, I read that in the real deal. Yeah. <laughs> it was up for 26 years. I mean, that's disgusting. It's I, I crazy. Can't that where you can that. check every, the, the, the time, the date, each one of those were put up. And it's astonishing as you click around how long they've been up. 
I mean, one thing I'll add that um, just kind of back to, you know, Amir's growth, um, you know, into markets that generally don't have, you know, that don't benefit from the same type of coverage that we've gotten in New York for the last, you know, I guess since 2003, really, you know, when the real deal was launched, it's, um, you know, it's important to have, you know, the transparent view. You know, I think that, you know, the more people understand about how these markets behave, um, you know, the better. I think it'll take some of the fragmentation out of, you know, the investing. Um, but I, but I, but I think the knowledge is super helpful. Um, and it's, it's, it's yielding a, I think a more educated, um, you know, outcome, you know, which I think is, is really good. And, and for me, really interesting because, you know, we appreciate how important it is to be local. Um, you know, years ago, you used to have to kind of put boots on the ground and I mean, you still kind of do to a certain extent, but, you know, I don't want to gloss over, you know, just by kind of, you know, being thoughtful about, you know, what you read you're going to be an expert, but it helps a lot. Um, and it's been interesting to see how these markets have grown. Uh, and I think it'll be interesting to see how some of them contract or just don't, you know, trend quite as aggressively up into the right, but that's the cycle, right? So no, you've, got a, you've got a billion dollars worth of uh, apartments in New York. You're a big better. You've already said you're optimistic and you are doubling to, and, and you're always a buyer in New York. And Roberto used that word recovery. I still have to ask, where are we headed now? Because I know that we've just finished getting a ton. In New York City, we were not balancing our budget and we were looking at service cuts to transportation, not funding our MTA, all kinds of issues. The federal stimulus came in and it's made a lot of us forget that, but I'm worried. I'm worried about New York. Tell me why I should not be worried about New York. I mean, we have not gotten back our, our hotel and uh, uh, tourism business. Um, and we've got major problems in terms of our friction. It's coming to back. Allow it's, things it, get done. Yeah. So, so I think some of these things are going to take some more time, but I think the, you know, the data around tourism is improving. Um, I think the, 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 the short answer to your question though, is, you know, New York city will come back because if it doesn't, the United States is in a terrible position. It is incredibly important you know, being that it represents, I don't, I think roughly 10% of the domestic GDP, um, which is an outrageous number, you know, into the trillions of dollars, um, you know, or at least a trillion dollars, I think. So again, maybe don't fact check me, but uh, it's just culturally and financially, um, it's, it's just, it, it has to happen. And that's, that's, which you know, my, industry, my view. which industries drive that growth? A lot of it's been said in the real estate business about Amazon, Facebook, Google, all tech moving into New York and it becoming an equal, uh, equal to Silicon Valley, an equal partner. Is that is it? Are we depending on tech? It's it's going to be helpful. Yeah, I don't. Again, I don't have the 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 math necessarily. It's going to drive you know a you know the the outcome that I that I think. Um, you know, live somewhere in the future, but yeah, tech, tech would be very helpful. Healthcare, you know, education. We're fortunately to Where have are all those pretty... people coming from. You're going to have to fill a million apartments, but Boston last week, they said biotech. They said, we are all about bioscience. Boston is a tiny we city. Don't... I mean, Boston is think... the 24th largest city in the country. I, I, I think what we're, you know, I, I don't, I don't, New York city has got a lot of problems, you know, as do all of the, you know, the top three or four or five largest cities in, in the world. Um, we have an issue, you know, with our own identity, right? The diversity that we talk about, which is, you know, the culture, right? People that come from different places, different socioeconomic backgrounds, people that look different than you, but they live in the same communities as you and they shop in the same places and generally enjoy the same things. Like that cross section of society is New York, right? So affordability um, or lack of impairs, you know, the, the, the chief characteristic of New York. So I, yeah, look, I, I think it's going to be, it may be a rough road. I don't know. How did people feel in the seventies? I wasn't alive, but I, I know New York city struggled with its budget. I have friends whose families owned real estate companies back then that are massive and generational. Um, they kind of echo the same thing that, you know, I'm probably doing a poor job of articulating, but you know, there's a need for New York city to be relevant. I don't, but John, you mentioned, uh, how are we going to fill those apartments? We're not having trouble filling apartments. The people are here. It's a matter of the hybrid working and the hybrid working is starting to change. 
the people who come to New York are people that are really focused on culture. They want to be involved. They want to dig their fingers into, in, into what it offers and they want to contribute. They want to be a part of it. And once the back to work gets continues and it's it started slow it's about 40 percent, but it seems to be still increasing it's being led by the financial industry the financial industry is about 35 percent of that tech is another healthcare is another law the law firms are a little slower because they found that they're really efficient kind of working from home but that eventually like i've always talked about the i think the hiring cycle people are going to you know people have a little bit of leverage right now and that they you know they can stay home but i think once that hiring cycle starts and someone loses their job, the next person comes in and they're looking at, it's down to two people and they're like, this person wants to be at work. They're gonna choose that person and the other person's gonna be out. And I think it's just gonna slowly come back and come back. And then once those, once those offices fill up, the retail fills up. But I just, you know, I, I, I am very optimistic about, about New York, but it'll take time. I mean, for me, it's, you just, I feel like even though the large offices are still vacant, uh, to just try to go across town at any time. I feel like I'm constantly stuck in traffic. So, it's, you know, all these people are going somewhere. They're going to restaurants. They're using the facilities in some some form or another. So, you know, I, I, I feel very optimistic about it. And I always feel like in every market, in every market, no matter where the global market is, the top 1%, top 2%, top 3%, they're always doing well. They all, there's always a way for them to do well because they are in that in that stratosphere and i it, for me new york city as a city as it, it, that's the currency it has it's in that top one percent like it will always do well people will always want to be here be part of this energy i mean just walk through you know the, the west village or even on the upper east side and upper west side there's so much energy and there's uh, that is that is a real thing even though it's energy it's a tangible thing people who walk through those streets they feel differently they feel amazing there's a reason why people miss it and come it's strange you know tourists and people who live here you know i i walk around with my head up the weather has been nice recently and i'm walking around and i'm like this is there's such an incredible vibe here and it felt so great and i know it sounds silly and hippie-ish to say something like that but there, there's a difference. I walk around Dallas too. I walk around all these other cities we have, uh, you know, we have uh, offices in and it's not the same thing. I hate to say it, like I was in San Francisco in the spring. I was in downtown San Francisco at two in the afternoon, three in the afternoon. Uh, and I could look for blocks and not see a single person. And I'm in downtown San Francisco, you know, and I look up and there's like four high rises at each corner of the street that I'm on. And uh, they all say Salesforce on them. And just earlier that day, Mark Benoff, the founder and CEO of Salesforce was like, remote work is gonna be permanent. And I'm thinking, oh my God, these, you know, you had million, 4 million square feet all around me right there. That's just gonna be empty, you know, for San Francisco. And I'm more, you know, I'm more, uh, you know, I feel worse for those cities than I do for New York. I feel like New York is fine. I'm talking to my friends in Europe. They, you know, it's harder for them to come here because the dollar is so strong. But there's still that demand where they want, oh, my God, I got to come there. I, gotta, I haven't been there this year. I got to come there. I, I live in a lot of places across the country. I've never had people have that urge to come and just visit the city, you know. And it's still the number one most visited city. You got 60 million people a year that come to New York City. And it only accounts for, like, I think 12% of our economy or something like that. But uh, it's incredible. We'll cut, and you need nine people and you need them in Dallas. This is your chance. You got like, you know, 30 seconds, pull a spot right here. And what do you need? Do you need if writers? I only have 30 seconds, please go and buy our book, The New Kings of New York. It talks about the development in New York City for the last 20 years and all, you know, the city, like the way the skyline changed. And we got a lot of great access from Steve Ross of uh, uh, Related, Dan Doktorov, uh, you know, uh, Maclow and all these guys, Harry Bar uh, Gary Barnett. So that's a, that's a great book. I would recommend that you go to Amazon. It's in the top 1% on Amazon, which we are very pleased with. So uh, do go and purchase it. I'm going to go, I'm going to go get that book. Absolutely. Right, great. I'll send you the link. <laughs> all right. And Aaron, what are you reading now? <laughs> I'm reading what do you the real deal. That's, that's what I'm reading. I'm trying to. I don't want to speak for that. Aaron, but I'm guessing he's reading the closing of another book that we did a while back. <laughs> that has all the interviews. I do. I do. I do have it. No, no. I'm trying to keep up with the uh, the news in and of itself is challenging to uh, to keep up with. But uh, no, this has been great, guys. I appreciate you including me and, and Amir. This was fun, and 
Thank you. Yeah, let's uh, let's find time to do it again in the future. See if uh, some of these predictions are are right or wrong. Yeah. Thank right. you guys. This was great. Thank you, Roberto. Thank you so much. Bye, guys. I really appreciate it. Fantastic insight. Thanks, guys. Take care, guys. And Roberto, who do we have next week? We have Louise Phillips and Lisa Lipman. It'll be good. It'll be good. All right. See everybody next week. See ya. Bye.